morning, we are continuing this series uh, entitled Classic Rock, where we've talked about song titles from, from classic uh, rock and roll bands and artists. So we've discussed <clears throat> previously the Beatles, and we've done uh, different ones. This morning is not really a band as much as it is an individual known simply by his name. He was that guy. Uh, Jimi Hendrix was born in Seattle, Washington in 1942. He began playing the guitar at the age of 15. In 1961, the age of 19, he enlisted in the U.S. Army, and he served in the Army for about, a, for about a year. He was discharged from the Army when he was 20 years old. Jimi Hendrix loved music, playing the guitar, so he moved to Nashville, Tennessee which you wouldn't associate Nashville necessarily with Jimmy's style of music, but he went there and he began to play on for different bands and different artists. Finally, then, uh, he moved to London, England, of all places. He, uh, he moved there in 1966, and he formed a band called the Jimi Hendrix Experience. So that's a, that's a pretty awesome band name. You're like, guys, I'm so great, I'm just going to name the band after me. So <laughs> the Jimi Hendrix Experience, they released a number of hits over the next few years, and by 1969, Jimi Hendrix was the highest paid performer in the world. He was the headliner at the original Woodstock, and he was on top of the world. In September of 1970, Jimi Hendrix died of a drug overdose at the age of 27, 27 years old. He died in London, England of a drug overdose. But Jimi Hendrix, I really, really like his music. So I got the microphone and I can pick the songs that I want. So <laughs> I like Jimi Hendrix music. I really do. And so here is All Along the Watchtower by Jimi Hendrix. Turn, if you will, to 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. In your Old Testament, this is the life and reign of King Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning with verse 5. 2 Kings 18 and 5. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him and kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him, and Hezekiah prospered wherever he went. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Hezekiah subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory, from watchtower to fortified city. You didn't think I could do it, but I did. <laughs> he subdued the Philistines. He won mighty victories. He was prosperous from watchtower to fortified city. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the next few moments that you will speak to us. We long to hear from you. We, we need to hear from you. We must hear from you. Let your presence move in this place. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Hezekiah was at the top of his reign and ministry and kingship. He, had, he was prosperous. He was blessed. God was leading him. God, he was obeying God. He was doing what God called him to do. Everything was going great for Hezekiah. He destroyed the Philistines from watchtower to fortified city. He was winning battles. He was winning victories. Everything was going great. Buried in that list of everything going great is the seed of what we want to deal with this morning. Did you see it? Turn back, if you will, to chapter, uh, verse 7. And it says, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria. Everything is going great, but right there is the foundation for what we want to deal with this morning because the king of Assyria did not particularly enjoy being rebelled against. So not long after this, and we're going to read it in just a minute, the Assyrian king and his warriors and his armies marched against the nation of Judah and against the capital city of Jerusalem. They find themselves, Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem find themselves waking up one morning looking out at this massive, massive, enormous army of the Assyrians. And that is where we're about to pick up. Turn, if you will, now in 2 Kings chapter 18. Look, if you will, at verse 19. 
2 Kings 18 and 19. Then the Rabshakai. Let me stop you right there. The Rabshakai is probably better in translated like chief of staff. So he is the, the direct subordinate of the king of Assyria. Remember, kings don't talk to normal people. Kings don't talk to ordinary people. So the Rabshakai is the chief of staff of the Assyrian army. And he comes down to the walls of Jerusalem to talk to the people on the walls. Now remember, Hezekiah is not there either because kings don't talk to normal people. So the Rabshakai approaches the walls of Jerusalem. 2 Kings 18 and 19. Then the Rabshakai said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? You speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. In whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. All right, so we pick up this story. Hezekiah is going great. Everything's wonderful. He rebels against Assyria. The king of Assyria and all of his nations march against Jerusalem. And now the number two guy in the Assyrian army, the Rabshakai, comes out to the walls of Jerusalem and yells up to those on the walls. What does he say? Why are you trusting in Pharaoh? Why are you trusting in the king of Egypt? The king of Egypt cannot help you. You're trusting in the wrong person. The Rabshakai, before they attack, they are bringing accusations. That's how all, that's how all stuff that comes against us begins. It begins with an accusation. The, 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 the battle doesn't begin immediately. The battle comes, the, the, the struggles, the trials of life all begin with an accusation. So let me tell you about the only time that my wife got sent to the principal's office. <laughs> Courtney and I started dating when I was 15 years old. I was a sophomore in high school. We started dating when I was 15 years old. At lunch, she would sit at the table with me and my equally, uh, what's a good word for my friends? Um, disobedient, maybe? That's a nice word. My, um, lots of shenanigans happening at the lunch table with me and my friends. And my girlfriend would sit with me. I was the only one that had a girlfriend, so it was me, my dumb friends, and Courtney. So one day we were doing something, I can't remember what it was, but the teacher had had enough of us. And so the teacher walked by and said, okay, everybody at this table go to the principal's office. That included Courtney. So we all walked in, my friends were walking in front of me, and I turned to her and I said, now you're going to see how unreasonable the principal is. He's always yelling at us, He's not a, now you're going to see what I go through all the time. We walked into the principal's office, he said, what, are, what happened? So we were trying to explain our side of the story about whatever we were doing at lunch. And he was listening to the story, and all of a sudden he saw Courtney standing in the back of the room. He said, what are you doing in here, Courtney? She said, I don't know. I was sitting at the table, and the teacher told all of us to go to the principal's office. And he said, oh, I know you weren't doing anything. Go back to class. <laughs> and I was like, what? Are you kidding me? That's the only time my wife ever went to the principal's office. <laughs> It was so unreasonable of him. <laughs> so the battle never begins with a battle. The things that come against us in life never begin fully formed. They start as the whisper. They start as that accusation. They start as that, did you hear what, dot, dot, dot. Hey, did you hear about this and that. Did you hear what they said, what they did? All of those things that eventually explode in our lives all begin with accusations. The Rabshakai comes to the walls of Jerusalem and he says, have you put your trust in the Pharaoh of Egypt? He is nothing but a broken stick. The first thing about accusations is this. Accusations always contain an element of truth. 
They always contain an element of truth. This is what is so confusing when you're being accused of something. This is what often confuses others and confuses us. He begins with truth. It is truth. You cannot put your trust in the Pharaoh of Egypt. He says it's a broken stick. If you lean on it, it'll pierce your hand. It'll cut your hand leaning on Egypt. It's true. The Assyrian nation was mightier than the Egyptians at that point. So he says to them, the Rabshakeh yells up at them and says, you cannot trust in Egypt. And it's true in their heart of hearts, the people on the walls know that they can't trust in Egypt, which means what? This is how accusations work, right? If the first sentence I say is true, then what? All the other stuff I say after it has to be true also. That is how accusations against us work. That is how people that are trying to pull you into their gossip campaign, that's how they operate. They give you a truth, and then if that one thing was true, then the next sentence must be true, and the next sentence must be true, and the next sentence must be true. Do you remember this icebreaker game where you would give, you would say, two truths and a lie? Do you remember this? People would go around. It's just a game to get to know each other. So you might say three statements. So I might say, I've been on every inhabited continent of the earth. I know how to play the guitar. I have been expelled from high school. Two truths and a lie. If you've been going to church here long enough, you know what the two truths are. (laughs) And you know what the lie is, because I can't do that like Jimmy. Okay? So that's the, the game, two truths and a lie. But all of those things sound reasonable. None of them sound extravagant. I didn't say something like, I used to be an assassin for the CIA. That's obviously a lie. Maybe, or is it? <laughs> right? So that's obviously a lie. So the thing is, the Rabshakeh says you can't trust in Egypt. And everybody on the wall goes, yeah, yeah, that's true. They already beat Egypt. And then when he says other stuff... That sounds like truth, just like the first thing did. My dad used to tell me when he was trying to get me to tell the truth, which was, which was a struggle in itself in high school, he used to tell me all the time, a partial truth is a lie. A partial truth is a lie. And he's right. All accusations contain that element of truth, though. And that's what can be confusing. It's also what confuses others about, about us. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But that idea that there is some truth in that. They say this thing, so it's not, say it's not just an accusation against somebody else. Say it's something against you. Better yet, say it's that internal voice inside of you. We know ourselves better than anybody. And, and we begin with those truths about us. Travis is... Dot, dot, dot. Travis did... Dot, dot, dot. And we did. We know our past. We know who we were. So if that was true about us in the past, maybe all the other things that the accuser is bringing against us, maybe those are true too. All right? So stay with me now. Back to 2 Kings 18. So the Rabshakeh comes and he speaks truth. He says, you cannot depend on Egypt. Now look at 2 Kings 18 and 26. Then Eliakim... And Joah said to the Rabshakeh, so remember what I said, the kings don't talk. The Rabshakeh is on the ground outside of Jerusalem. These guys that work for Hezekiah are up on the wall talking to each other. And Eliakim and Joah, look what they say to the Rabshakeh. Please speak to us in Aramaic, for we understand it. And do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. So they're all lined up on the wall, right? This huge thing. And the Rabshakeh, he, they say to him, they say, don't speak to in Hebrew. Everybody on the, we're all Hebrews. We're all Jews, right? We all speak Hebrew. Speak to us in Aramaic because only we speak Aramaic and you speak Aramaic so we can talk to each other and nobody else can understand what we're saying. They say, just speak to us in Aramaic. Verse 27, but the Rabshakeh said to them, has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and spoke saying, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. The next thing is this, accusations speak our language. 
Accusations speak our language. They know the unique thing that is specific to us, that gets us, that cuts us the deepest. Do you understand the accusation against Rico, his accusation that's specific to him and his life does not affect me as deeply as it does him. And vice versa, the thing that might bother Lee doesn't bother me, but the thing that would bother me probably wouldn't bother him. The, accu- the accuser, the accusations speak our language. They speak the unique language that bothers and frustrates us uniquely. I'm 46 years old now. I've gotten over it. I've moved past it. But early in my ministry, Cannot tell you the number of people that would come up to me and say, boy, that was a good sermon. But you know who's a really great speaker? Your dad. That was good. But you know who's really, really great at this? This same thing that you do. You were okay. But you know who's really good at it? Your dad. It doesn't bother me anymore. It's okay. It doesn't doesn't get me like it used to. (laughs) I'm comfortable and confident in who I am and what I do here. It's fine. But that probably wouldn't bother Rico if something said like that, or to Lee, or to Corey, or whoever it was, right? The Rabshakai speaks our language. He knows the thing from your past. He knows the button to push. He knows, the, he knows your triggers. He knows the things that set you off. He knows the stuff that you've struggled with your entire life. Those things that you feel insecure about. Those things that you're uncomfortable with. Those things that you just don't know if you measure up or if you're good enough. The accuser always speaks your language. You need to be aware of that. Specifically, not just with other people. We are our own worst accuser. My worst accuser is myself. And we know our own language. We know the things that we're embarrassed about. We know the things that we struggle with. We know our past. We know the stuff that we've dealt with. And so we accuse ourselves in our own language most frequently. Revelation tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He will use others to accuse you. He will do that. But to be honest, the most accusing voice that comes is the the voice from inside of us. We are our own worst critic. We are our own harshest critic. We accuse ourselves and we speak our own language and we accuse ourselves internally. Why can't we do that better? Why can't we? Oh, don't you remember what we used to do? Don't you remember who we were? We, We have to get over we, ha- we must be willing to listen to God speak about us and not the Rabshakai accusing us in our own language. Accusations speak our language. They are uniquely fomented to frighten and scare and defeat you. And you must be aware of that. Now, look at what happens. 2 Kings 18. Now in verse 29, right where we left off. The Rabshakeh is speaking, and he says, Thus says the king of Assyria, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Skip to verse 35, same chapter. Who among all the gods of the land have delivered their countries from my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? So the Rabshakeh says, you can't trust in Egypt. Now he says, you can't trust in God either. None of the other countries that we've invaded, none of their gods have ever protected them. Why would your God deliver you? Your Lord cannot protect Jerusalem any more than all the other gods protected their countries and their capitals and their people. The accusation begins with truth. You can't trust in Egypt. The accusation continues in the language that they speak. And finally, he brings it to the culmination, which is God cannot protect you. Now, I want you to see what Hezekiah does. Look over one chapter to 2 Kings 19 and 20. 2 Kings 19 and 20. We're not going to read all of it, but basically they tell Hezekiah this, and Hezekiah goes in before the Lord and prays. 
That's all he does. He falls on his knees and he prays. He prays and he prays and he prays to God. And look how God answers. Then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah saying, by the way, that's Isaiah that wrote Isaiah. Okay, that's not another Isaiah. Then Isaiah the prophet said, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. I have heard. Here's the final thing. Accusations always underestimate God's power. Accusations always underestimate who God is. They knew who Hezekiah was. They knew who the walls of Jerusalem were. They knew who the armies of Judah were. They understood. They said, we're more powerful. We destroyed Egypt. We destroyed all these other countries. And just like we destroyed them, we will destroy Judah and Hezekiah and Jerusalem. But what they underestimated was what God could do. Accusations always underestimate God's power. Hezekiah didn't do anything to bring this about. He simply went in the palace, in the temple, and prayed. That's all. God didn't tell him to do anything. God didn't say you have to do this or you have to do that. God said, I will deal with the king of Assyria. Accusations always underestimate God's power for us. They The accusations are accurate in how weak we are. They are radically disaccurate in how powerful God is. They always want to accuse us in our weakness. They always want to point out our past. They always want to say, remember when you did this. They speak in our own language. Accusations are designed to destroy us, to accuse us, to frighten us, to scare us, to win the battle. Why did the Rabshakai come there in the first place? It was to dishearten the people before the battle even started. It was what? To convince them to surrender so that they wouldn't be killed. That's what accusations want. That's what accusations call for. They say, you're not powerful enough to overcome. You can't do this on your own. You'll never be free of that addiction. You'll never overcome your past. You'll never be free of all these things. And the accusations pile up and pile up and pile up. And what do we do? We say to ourselves, it's true. Look at what a terrible person I am. Look at all the stuff that I've done. And we surrender before God can win the battle. God is on our side. We don't have to fight that battle. The accusation is psychological warfare. The accusation is trying to defeat us and destroy us before we can fight. Don't allow the accusation to destroy what God can do. We give up and we don't allow God to to move forward. My dad told me an interesting story. He said years and years and years ago when he was in high school, him and some buddies had gone out to a restaurant. They had gone there, and there was a boy that they knew from high school. And he was sitting in a booth with a girl that they didn't recognize. And so they went over to the booth to talk to the boy, and my dad said that one of his friends was being sort of overly uh, aggressive, I guess would be the word. So the boy and the girl were sitting across from each other, looking at each other, and he squeezed his way in next to the girl. And he, my dad said that the boy they went to high school with said, don't. My dad said that guy sitting next to that girl didn't listen. And dad said that they were talking, and he said he put his arm around this girl. And my dad said he heard the guy on the, in the booth say, don't. Just like that. Dad said he didn't yell and scream. He didn't curse. He didn't raise his voice. He just said, don't, a second time. Finally, my dad said his friend reached over and kissed a girl on the cheek. And he said that the boy that was in the booth stood up, grabbed the kid, pulled him up, and punched him backward through a plate glass window in the restaurant. My dad said the guy was outside in the parking lot, covered in glass, knocked out, My dad said they jumped through the window, grabbed the kid, threw him in the back of the car and left. He said they could see the owner of the restaurant calling the cops and they just drove off. My dad said he was in the back of the car with this guy and he was smacking his face. He had knocked him out, knocked him through a window, knocked him out. He was smacking his face. And finally the guy came to in the back of the car. My dad said, what is wrong with you? Didn't you hear him say don't? Didn't you hear him say don't? My dad said, the kid said, well... I underestimated the depth of the relationship. (laughs) Listen to me. 
the accusations in our lives, they have underestimated God's power for us. They have underestimated his victory. We are more than conquerors. We walk in his victory parade. We, we, but the only way, the only way that we don't inherit the victory is if we surrender to the accusations. If Hezekiah, instead of praying, had surrendered, he never would have seen God's victorious power at work. And what does God do? Look, if you will, 2 Kings 19 and 20. Actually, we read 20. He said, because of you, I have heard. Because you prayed, I have heard what you have prayed. Now look at 2 Kings 19 and 32. 2 Kings 19 and 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. And he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass on a certain night, that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. God brought the victory. God brings the power. But what happens is we allow the accusations to defeat us before God can bring us to victory. The accusations, they speak truth. They say this, and it's true. And so if that's true, then it's all true. And they speak in our language. They know exactly what hurts us, what twists the knife. So let me close with this. What is... What is God's victory for us? Where do we see that happen? We see that happen in one place that we continue to remember. And that is the Last Supper. Jesus with the disciples. He says to them, this is my body. This is my blood. It doesn't feel in that moment victorious, does it? Because he says, this is my body broken. He says, this is my blood shed. And it doesn't feel all that victorious, but it is. What does he say? Do this to remember me. Do this to remember me. Remember what? Remember his victory that he won on the cross and his victory that he won through his resurrection. Do this to remember me. This is the last Sunday of the month, but I also wanted to preach this sermon on this Sunday because I want to challenge you and encourage you. The accusations that you have in your life cannot stand up to the victory that Jesus won for us that we remember and celebrate through what we call communion. The accusations are specific for every person in here. The accusations say, I, let me, let's just pick one. The accusations say, and I'm not saying this, I'm saying this is the accusation. Well, God can never use you because you've been divorced, right? Or you and your spouse have both been divorced, so God has no purpose for you. <laughs> There's whole denominations built on that statement right there, okay? <laughs> He says, you can't be used because you've gone through the, is it truth? Yeah, I'm divorced. Yeah, my spouse is divorced. Yeah, okay, that's true. But listen to me. God still has a purpose and a destiny. He still wants you to walk in victory. He doesn't want you to surrender in that moment. There are others, it's truth. 
The accusation says you've been arrested, you've been in jail, you've been in prison. How could God ever use you? And yet we have people sitting in this room this morning that God is using them. Have they been in prison? Yes, that's truth, but their life isn't over. That is an accusation designed to make us surrender. We refuse to give up. We refuse to surrender. We pray and God's power brings the victory. That is how this works. Everybody has an accusation. The Rab Shakai knows the language that bothers me the most. He knows the language that bothers you the most. He knows the unique way to push the knife in and twist it in every single life. What does it tell us in John? Satan is a liar and the father of lies. As I said in Revelation, he's the accuser of the brethren. He speaks a little bit of truth. He adds a whole bunch of lies. He speaks in the language that we understand, and he slips the knife in, hoping to defeat us before the battle even begins. But our God is more victorious and more powerful. Our God, we walk in his victory parade, not because of anything we've done, and Hezekiah didn't do anything either. We pray, we fall on our faces before God like Hezekiah. We pray, and we wait for God's power to bring the victory. That's how we're going to close this. I'm going to invite the ushers to go to the back and prepare the elements. I'm going to invite the band and musicians to return to the stage. And this is what we are going to do in this moment. I know that there's a number of people moving around as everybody gets back to where they're supposed to be. But I want you to listen to what I'm saying here. That accusation that thing against your life, that thing that, God, that, the, that the accuser of the brethren has been speaking into your life, it is swallowed up in Jesus' victory on the cross. It is swallowed up in Jesus' overcoming resurrection power. That accusation that has haunted you that thing that, has, that you've struggled with since childhood, those things that have held you in bondage, those accusations, that the pain, the, the, all of that, none of that can stand up to the magnificent, glorious, wonderful, victorious power of God. God said, I will protect Jerusalem and Hezekiah and the people for my own sake. And he won the victory. Listen to me. You are not what the accusations say you are. You are not what the voice accuses you of. You are a child of God. You are bought at a great price. And you are more than a conqueror. As we celebrate this communion, don't dwell on the accusations. Instead, Listen to Jesus' voice. He says, My body broken for you. My blood shed for you. You are not what the accusations say you are. You are a child of God. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. Here's what we're going to do they're going to pass the elements. I want you to hold on to those elements. When they're done, I'm going to make my way back up to the front and we will receive communion together. As the band plays, I want you to focus on that. You are not what the accusations say you are. You are more than a conqueror. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your presence. We focus on you. We focus on your victory and your triumph and your resurrection. We do this to remember you. We block out the words of the accuser and we focus on your words where you call us sons and daughters of God. We thank you. We worship you and we focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.